African boy soldiers. Terrorist cells. All victims of groupthink. How does this happen? How does a society get to a point where people start ignoring moral and ethical consequences of their actions? It was Walter Lippmann who once said, when we all think alike, then no one is thinking. So, are you a victim of groupthink? You may be wondering, what is groupthink? Well, according to Oxford Dictionary, groupthink is a practice of thinking or making decisions as a group resulting typically in unchallenged, poor quality decision making. It discourages creativity and individual responsibility. It holds back any potential we have as a society. I first learned of this phenomenon from my teacher, and it didn't seem as something that I considered to be real or to impact me directly. After all, I didn't think I shared any likeliness to a terrorist. But it led me to ask myself, who owned my decisions? The answer to this question should be me. But what if it's not? I started to rethink how I made my actions. The idea of groupthink was first proposed by Irene Janet back in 1972, and he devised eight symptoms divided into three categories to make his theory testable. One, overestimations of the group. Common symptoms, illusion of invulnerability and unquestioned belief. Two, close-mindedness, common symptoms, rationalizing and stereotyping. And three, pressure towards uniformity, common symptoms, illusions of unanimity, direct pressure, mind guards, and self-censorship. I'd like to illustrate how these eight symptoms function by telling you a story. It may be typical of a cooperative setting anywhere in the world. Since I'm a teenager, I'll be telling you a story that my peers can relate with. But regardless of your age, I want you to see which of these characters you can identify yourself the most with. The group meets the newcomer, Jamie. When somebody new arrives, we know we should be kind, welcoming even. But that's not always the case when a group dynamic is involved. Blake, the leader of the group, explains that the group holds all the power and respect in the school and that no one can do anything to harm you. This is illusions of invulnerability, when people forget the, the consequences of their actions. But it can also be seen as unquestioned belief when a person forgets the moral and ethical consequences of their actions. Charlie says that others are either not smart enough, not talented enough, or not attractive enough to be part of their group, which is stereotyping. Jamie, who's afraid to, afraid to voice any doubts and deviations from the group's consensus, prefers to stay quiet, an example of self-censorship. Blake assumes that everyone in the group agrees without even asking for their opinion, an example of illusions of unanimity, when there's a mistaken view that everyone in the group agrees. Charlie reassures that Jamie agrees, an example of direct pressure. From time to time, the group will collectively rationalize to excuse their exclusive behavior, an example of rationalizing. And every now and then, a person in the group will take on the role of a mind guard, a person that holds back dissenting information that could harm the group in a way. You may recognize where this plotline is inspired from. If so, you remember how Katie was sucked into Regina's plastic world and ultimately did a lot of things that she regretted. But why do people do this? One answer could lie in pack mentality. The theory that proposes that people do things to achieve status and exclusivity. I can say that I have been one of these characters at some point in my life. And I'm not proud of the moments I acted as a Blake, since similar to the one in the story, there were times where I acted invulnerably and would propose things that would put others around me and myself at risk. I would shut others down if their ideas didn't resonate with my own. Three years ago, I can say that I was a very close-minded person with radical views. One of them, for example, was that global warming was a hoax orchestrated by the Chinese. Seriously, I'm not kidding. In a debate about this pressing matter, in my moment to speak, I literally yelled, global warming is fake. If we die, it's going to be because of Ebola. <laughs> Another misconception that I clung to was that homosexuals were an abomination. How could I look around the globe and see rising temperatures, rising seas, unprecedented species extinctions, and not see myself as somebody who could contribute to this reality. How could I assume 
that an all-loving deity would cast someone down just because of who they loved? How is it possible that societies evolved so that in-groups try to systematically eradicate the out-group? The day that I'd say my bubble of falsehood was finally burst was when a friend asked me a question that put my perfect world into perspective. The question, how would you feel if when the time came, you couldn't marry the person you loved? At the time, I just said, that's not the case in this scenario. But it led me to rethink that unfounded hate that I had towards individuals who, like myself, just wanted to live their life. I started to question other biases that I had, and instead of shutting down those who I would normally not engage in conversations, I decided to learn about the other side of the coin, and I asked questions to facilitate understanding. I even became aware about my carbon footprint. From that moment on, I asked myself, what could we do as a society if other people did the same? Change can be scary. It's hard to come to terms that our actions may be causing pain to somebody else, or that somebody else may be causing pain to us. Breaking free from the mainstream world is literally and figuratively like swimming against the current. It's hard and it poses many challenges. We're humans and we do make mistakes, but when we fail to notice them, it can cause irreparable damage to our society. Now, I've told you how you can identify groupthink. But of course, there can always be a solution to these things. So for example, examine your judgments, biases, and actions. Are they based on ideas that you yourself hold, or are they prescribed by those around you? Practice humility and vulnerability. Engage those of opposing viewpoints in conversations. They may, may learn something from you, as you will be learning something from them. Treat others and their perspectives with respect and compassion. They're equally deserving of your time as you are of theirs. Have courage to make your own decisions, even if they go against the grain. Once you know your own worth, you'll stop giving people discounts. Some of history's greatest heroes who broke the mold followed these steps and ultimately said no to groupthink. Take Rosa Parks, an Afro-American civil rights activist who stood up for what she believed in. How? By sitting down. Rosa Parks lived in a time where people of color were forced to give up their seats for white citizens, as if they were less deserving. She had the courage and stood up. She was arrested, but her arrest caused a 381-day boycott of the Montgomery bus system. The next year, segregation on public transport was officially banned. Today, we can look back at the hindsight of history and see how segregation was unkind and unfair. Rosa Parks will continue to be an inspira inspiration for those of us who are still fighting for our rights. Less than a month ago, 63 people were killed in anti-government protests in Nicaragua. 15 people, their whereabouts are still unknown, according to the Com Permanent Commission of Human Rights. Men and women took the streets to fight against the reform that would take away 5% of the retirement fund. In a country like Nicaragua, that was ranked with the lowest GDP in the Western Hemisphere in 2018, it's a lot of money. Peaceful protests soon turned into riots when anti-riot police arrived and the death toll rose in a few days. Much like Rosa Parks, they fought to break the status quo. They fought for their freedom of speech, their freedom of the press, and their freedom in general. Sadly, it cost them their life. It was Ray Davis who once said, the tribe often thinks the visionary has turned his back on them, when in fact, the visionary has simply turned his face to the future. So ask yourself, what kind of future will you help create? Will it be the future when we can grow together rather than apart? When we can listen to each other without judgment and to achieve a reality where we can all grow together, you just have to be yourself and not be scared of what others around you may think or say about you. Thank you.